Hey, what is up you guys? This is Steffi aka In My Humble Opinion and welcome back to another video. In this video, I'm going to be doing a review of The Handmaid's Tale Season 4 Episode 2. The episode is entitled Nightshade and in this video we are going to break down plot point by plot point, beat by beat, what happened and then I'm going to give you guys my thoughts. So let's get into this review. Okay, so I have my handy dandy notebook here. So let's get into this episode. So beginning of the episode starts and we hear a car pulling up outside of the Keys residence and the girls are a little alarmed, but June is like, no, it's okay. Come to find out the guards are outside of the Keys residence and they are looking for guardian Pogue who, you know, is dead. Also important to note too that Commander Keys is acting a bit strange and we do see a moment where Mrs. Keys just tells Commander Keys to, you know, drink up and we're like, hmm, what is that about? We're gonna realize what that's about later in the episode. So after the guards leave, Mrs. Keys asks June, how did I do? And June's like, you did good, but we gotta go because the guards, they're coming and eventually they're gonna start looking for us once they put two and two together. June then tells the other ladies that they need to leave and find Mayday. And some of the other girls, you know, they have their own opinions too. Like Alma wants to go to Texas. Brianna, who I thought her name was Kelsey. Her name is Brianna. Brianna then says, you know, I don't want to fight anymore. And June's like, well, buck up, bitch, basically, because you're in this. I didn't want to fight either, but here we are. Meanwhile, we go to Canada and we see Luke and Moira for the first time. And Luke is speaking on stage at some event. And then he invites Rita, who we see for the first time this season to speak on stage. And we're like, what is this? What is going on? Turns out this is an Angel's Flight charity event. And Angel's Flight is basically this charity organization that is meant to help children and adults who have fled from Gilead and help them transition into their new life here in Canada help them with that rehabilitation process. So we see that the people who are in Canada are basically getting their shit together and they are mobilizing, they are organizing, you know, they have a fitting charity name. And more importantly, they are using June as the face of this new organization. Like they are really leaning into this narrative that June is the savior, is the hero, and she is the poster person of our new charity. So at the event, we see Moira telling Rita, you know, thank you so much for speaking at our event. And Rita's like, yeah, man, like I was so nervous, but Luke is just really good at this. And Moira's like, yeah, who knew Luke was good at this. Who knew Luke was good at anything, honestly? And I feel like a lot of people who are watching the show are like, same Moira. So meanwhile, June is smuggled to this Jezebel house where she meets with someone who knows of a safe house where June and the other handmaids can run and escape to. She kind of takes a dig at June's height, which, hey man, justice for short people. But she also makes it a point to tell June that she's kind of given up on Mayday because she doesn't even know who these people are. Like, where are they? And the first time I was watching the episode, I was kind of like, yeah, same. Because I don't know about you guys, but even though June repeatedly says we are Mayday, at the same time too, I'm like, well, I don't know. I, I just feel like this idea of Mayday has been something that they've been dangling over our head for the longest time. And we've seen actions, seen things happen because of Mayday, but they've just been so absent and gone and just this mysterious kind of organization for a huge chunk of the show that I'm just, I'm a bit confused as to what Mayday exactly is too. After that, we then get this iconic hand scan of Serena, and this is how we know it's Serena. And we're seeing that Serena and her legal team are gearing up for battle against Fred Waterford, and their strategy is they're going to try and paint Serena as this victim. And they're making Serena do all these physical exams to expose the fact that Fred was abusive towards her. But in spite of all of these examinations, Serena is still defending Fred. And she clearly feels very conflicted inside. And Tuello at one point asks Serena, you know, why do you keep defending him? Don't you see how awful he is? And Serena's like, I, I knew him before all of this. And Tuello's just like, okay. And Serena then points out to Tuello, you know, you've now got me, your star witness, as an accused sex offender testifying against Fred, which you're also like, 
Good point, Serena. But I do have to say, when they were standing at that big window and Serena and Martuello were just like inching closer and closer and closer and closer towards each other, I was like, dang, the sexual tension is very real between these two. And I'm not gonna lie, I, would, I wouldn't hate it if these two got together at some point. Is it gonna last? Probably not. But for an episode, man, I, I would not hate that. Then after this, we see Emily and we see Moira. And then we see that Moira has a girlfriend. Going back to June. June, of course, savior June, hero June. June wants to free the Jezebels. Why? Because she can. And she's talking about her plans to save the Jezebels with the other handmaids. And Alma, like, man, Alma truly is one of my favorites because then she tells June, why June? Why do you want to free the Jezebels? This isn't part of the plan, June. Honestly, Alma is the one that is making the most sense in this conversation and probably speaking on behalf of all of us when she tells June, you can just leave June. Because as Alma points out, June has no plans. June just goes rogue. And even though she has good intention, she has the best intentions of wanting to save as many people as possible, at what cost, June? Especially when you have no plans. And guess what? We see the cost at the end of episode three. June then tells Mrs. Keys that they're leaving tomorrow night and Mrs. Keys is like, no, take me with you. And June is like, okay, fine, you can come with us. And then June is like, but wait, what about Commander Keys though? And then she like looks up at the ceiling and then puts two and two together and realizes that Mrs. Keys, our little chef here in the kitchen, has actually been poisoning Commander Keys. That's why she's very insistent on him like drinking that drink. June kind of saunters up to Mrs. Keys as she's like stirring in her little pot and she says, hey, can you make some more? Meanwhile, back in Canada, Serena then puts on her best skirt, her best little kitten heel. This is basically her version of putting on a freakum dress because she's gonna meet with Fred at the chapel they have going on where they're being held in custody. And she's gonna try and convince him to drop his charges against her. But as Fred points out, Serena's gotten a bit rusty and that does not work. This leads to a really heated argument between Fred and Serena where Fred is like, if you think you're gonna get Nicole, you are delusional. And Serena is like, I thought once you were out of Gilead, you'd come back to your old self. And Fred is just being a prime example of someone who once they're given just a little bit of power, you give them an inch, they take the mile. And Fred makes it very clear to Serena that he is not reverting back to his factory settings. This like heated argument between Fred and Serena is maybe my favorite scene of this episode because I just think the dynamic between these two is so interesting to watch and what I love about their argument is now that they're here in Canada so much is finally now being said. Fred is blaming Serena, Serena is blaming Fred, Fred is like, you're the person who made me this way. And Serena is like, I thought I'm the one that deserved everything you did to me. And you're just like, oh girl, what a mess. But it's a mess that I'm really interested in watching. This is then followed by one of my other favorite scenes in this episode. And it's when we see Moira going to visit this child named Asher, who was one of the kids on the plane. And we see that Asher is having a bit of a hard time adjusting to this new life here in Canada. He says that he misses his Martha. He says that he misses his parents, even though he's now staying with his biological aunt. And his aunt is so hurt every time he says these things because he's kind of denying this new life that he now has with actual family. And this is just another element that I really liked in this episode because this is new. Like for the first time, we're seeing how difficult it is for a child to transition from living in Gilead to now living in Canada because their life in Gilead, the way it was over there is all they ever knew. And now they're here in Canada and they're like culture shocked and they're angry and they're grieving their previous life. It just goes to show how difficult it is for the child and also for the people who are now taking in these children. So after this scene, Moira then meets up with Emily and it's like, hey, I got the form. By the way, that kid Asher, he's like really messed up because he actually misses Gilead. And Emily is like, well, you know, that's June. Maybe June just wasn't thinking this all the way through. And Moira's like, yep, that's June. She just like swings big for the fences and she doesn't think about 
about the consequences. And this bit of dialogue, I feel like was the writers kind of acknowledging all of the problems that people had been bringing up about June in previous seasons. Like, I feel like you could even make the argument that they may have like lifted some of the comment section in different blogs and reviews. Moira then tells Emily that she has a bit of survivor's remorse, survivor's guilt, because she's the one that made it out of there. And that's the reason why she feels emotionally, morally obligated to June and to clean up June's mess, even though it's really hard for her to take care of Nicole. And then Emily's like, I gotcha girl, June like gave me her kid and I fled here to Canada and I didn't ask for that, but now we're both here. So you're just like, oh, June. We then go back to Miss June and June is on her way to her rogue mission. She's about to get into the van and Janine like runs up to her and is like, hey, are you sure you don't need help? And typical June, I can do this by myself. We go back to Canada and we see that now Moira has returned to Asher's house, but this time she brought Rita. And when Rita greets Asher, she greets him in the traditional Gilead way. We see Asher kind of loosen up a bit because seeing Rita, interacting with Rita, reminds him of Gilead, reminds him of his home. And um, you're just like, good job, good job, Moira, good job, Rita. Having Rita visit Asher periodically is going to help ease Asher's anxiety living in Canada. We see quite a bit of Moira in this episode and she is now having pad thai with her girlfriend on the steps and they're laughing and eating and having a good time. And then we see the car pull up to, you know, bring Moira's girlfriend to work. And Moira's girlfriend is like, you could come with me to work, which then leads to the inevitable question. What exactly does Moira's girlfriend do for work? We then cut back to June and June is getting ready with another Jezebel to poison the men and the aunts that are in this Jezebel house. And you know, this is especially satisfying to watch after one of the aunts goes up to this Jezebel and it's like, you better watch what you eat and like pinches her cheek and calls her Piggy. It's like, um, Miss Ma'am, have you looked into a mirror? We briefly cut back to Canada where Serena is outside waiting for Tuello. And she's like, the deal is off. Like Fred and I, we are not on the same page. And Tuello drops a bombshell. Serena is pregnant. Duh, duh, duh. We then cut back to this poisoning sequence that's scored by David Bowie's Suffragette City. And it's like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Very rock and roll, very cool. You're kind of on this high and you're like, yeah. But this is The Handmaid's Tale and the highs can only last for so long because the episode basically ends with June being driven back to the Keys residence by the guard. June realizes that it's quiet a little too quiet and she she's like something's wrong so they get out of the car and she's like i could do this by myself typical june and the guard's like no ride or die and well die because then he gets shot out of nowhere and he dies june then has all these red sniper lasers aimed at her from different directions she looks up and who emerges from the dark it's Nick. Nick has captured June and the handmaids have fled the scene without her. Nick then bends down and whispers in June's ear that he will try and keep her alive. So yes, that's exactly how episode two, season four of The Handmaid's Tale ends with June once again being captured. And well, what's to come in episode three? Oof. So now I'm just gonna give my general post-show thoughts on this episode. First main point for me, at this point in the series, at this point in the show, Canada is infinitely way more interesting to me than Gilead or specifically what is going on with June and the Handmaids. To me, Canada is new. The characters are moving forward. Their stories are evolving. And I just love seeing how Moira, Luke, Emily, and Rita are not necessarily moving on from what is happening in Gilead, but they are moving forward. They're taking actual steps forward. They have a plan of how they can help, how they can help others, how they can help get June back, which is very refreshing for me as a viewer to see because you know who doesn't have plans? Our protagonist of the show, our main girl, June. Miss June, 
just goes rogue. She has no plans whatsoever. I don't know about you guys, but for me, rewatching this episode just made me even more annoyed at June. And again, knowing what's to come in episode three, I just feel as a character, June is very impulsive. And while again, I understand that she has good intentions, she's so reckless. To me, there are just too many people, whether it be people in the Gilead-ish area or people back in Canada, there are too many people at this point in the story that are galvanizing her as the savior, as the hero, for her to be making too many risky decisions like this. And I think the thing that maybe most annoys me about June is that she has this very lone wolf approach. But the thing is, June isn't a lone wolf. Not only are there people that are relying on her, but she has a lot of people that are willing to help her out. But it's June who totally believes in this idea that she alone is the one that's gonna help everyone. She pushes people away. And when she does that, sometimes she makes the situation a lot worse and she compromises not only herself, but other people, which we're gonna see happen in episode three. Seeing June in this constant pattern is very frustrating and tiresome to watch four seasons into this show. And I wish I could say that things get better next episode, but they don't. Right. Well, my question for you guys in this episode is regarding that bombshell news about Miss Serena. So we learned that Serena is pregnant. But the question is, is the father really Fred? Because even though we did see Serena and Fred have sex in that house in season three, the show also emphasized the fact that Fred is sterile. So exactly how did Serena miraculously become pregnant? Pregnant. There's a part of me, there's a part of me that really <laughs> kind of hopes that Tuello is the father of Serena's child, even though at no point whatsoever have we seen these two characters like actually kiss, let alone have sex with each other. So I don't know how possible that is, but <laughs> I've like, I'm holding out on hope that the, the father is Tuello. But yeah, I just want to know like, who do you guys think the father of Serena's child is like are you a thousand percent sure it's Fred that it has to be Fred or do you think that there's a small chance that it might be Tuello's let me know in the comment section below all right well that's about it for this video if you liked it please give this video a thumbs up don't forget to hit the subscribe button and please turn on the notification button down below so you know when a new video from me comes out and comment down below your thoughts on episode two season four of the handmaid's tale i'd like to know what are you thinking so far about the show are you are you happy with the fact that june got captured yet again in this episode let me know because i will tell you that when i watched these first three episodes the first time i was i was a bit annoyed and a bit frustrated so yeah, just let me know your thoughts. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Tomorrow, my review for episode three should be up. So look out for that. As always, everything I said, which is my own personal thoughts and all my humble opinion. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.